John Robert Lewis is a civil rights leader who went from the cotton fields of Alabama to the halls of Congress. His life of activism and public service grew out of humble beginnings and segregated education. We had uh, the hand-me-down books, the broken down buses. Segregation was real. You could see it. You could see it with your naked eye. I saw it as a young child. Although segregated schools were woefully inadequate, John Lewis knew education was the path to a better life. As a seminary student, he began to sense what he called the spirit of history, which drew him into the struggle. I've been told over and over again by my parents and grandparents, don't get in trouble. But I got in trouble. It was good trouble. It was necessary trouble. I felt liberated. I felt free. I felt in a real sense that I had crossed over. From leading the early nonviolent campaigns against entrenched segregation to the March on Washington, John Lewis played a leading role in the civil rights movement. Leader, legend, and U.S. Congressman John Lewis is joined now by a group of Twin Cities teens to discuss civil rights across generations. I'm Leah Bielson, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you Representative John Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Lewis, you were involved in the civil rights movement at such a young age, the same age as obviously many of these kids in this room. What can you say to them to help get them involved, and how did you get involved? Well, let me say I'm delighted and, and very pleased to be here with these wonderful, smart, gifted, and talented young people. When I was very young, I saw segregation, I saw racial discrimination. I didn't like it. I asked my mother, my father, my parents, and grandparents, why, why? They said, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way. Don't get in trouble. But at a young age, I heard about Rosa Parks when I was 15 years old in the 10th grade. I heard about Martin Luther King Jr. I met Rosa Parks the first time in 1957 when I was 17. I met Dr. King when I was 18 and 58. And it changed my life. Many of the young people that I grew up with, went to school with, high school and later college, got involved. We were deeply inspired to do something. Mm -hmm. And I tried to do my best to break down the walls of segregation and racial discrimination. We all can do something. And how can we get this group of young people involved? Well, young people should study the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. Watch the movies, the video, Eyes on a Prize. Uh, we just didn't one day wake up and say we're going to go and sit in. We had nonviolent workshop. We had role playing for black and white students, high school students, elementary school students, college students would come together and go down and sit in. And we'd be sitting down and sometimes we would get beaten up. Sometimes we would get arrested and go to jail. Sometimes someone would spit on us or knock us around, but we didn't hit back. We didn't strike back. We accepted nonviolence as a way of life, as a way of living. We really believed in it, because we were deeply touched by the action of Martin Luther King, Jr. It was a wonderful period in American history to see so many young people just putting everything they had on the line. Um, obviously, since nonviolence was a major philosophy of your life, was there ever a point when you just reached like an apex of just so much frustration and anger that you for a second thought that, you know, maybe I'm going about this the wrong way and then you came back and said, you know what, this is my life, this is my choice, this is how I'm going to live in a nonviolent fashion. What was that? Was there a point like that for you? I never ever thought about giving up on the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. For me, it became more than a technique, a tactic, it became a way of life a way of living. When you accept nonviolent, simply as a technique, as a tactic, it's like a faucet. You can turn it on and you can turn it off. But if you accept it as a way of life, as a way of living, your whole life is controlled by the way of love, the way of peace. So you see people as innocent. See, we don't come in this world as babies, as little children. We don't come here hating people because of their race or their color. Something happened to us Some, along the way. We're taught to hate our environment. So when I was being beaten uh, by a state trooper, 
or by a member of an angry mob. I didn't hate. I, I, I was not going to let that person make me hate them. I was going to love them and continue to love. Because love is a better way. If you're something nonviolent, simply as a technique, as a tactic, you'll say today, well, I'm going to love Sue, I love Joe, I love Mary, and tomorrow you will hate or dislike someone. Love is a better way. During this time period, how did you stay so strong and so motivated, and how did you keep your head up, and what motivated you the most during this? As a young child, uh, listened to Dr. King and others and been taught the way of love and nonviolent, somehow I think I made up my mind that I was not going to hate. I was not going to become bitter. I had what we call an executive session with yourself. You know, sometimes we talk to ourselves. Mm -hmm. The dangerous thing when you start talking back to yourself. Right. So never <laughs> talk back to yourself. But I made up my mind a long time ago as a young child that I was not going to hate. Hate is too heavy a burden to bear. Again, love is a better way. And so someone beats you, someone spit on you, throw you in jail. I got arrested and went to jail 40 times during the 60s. But I, I don't hate. I don't have any ill feeling toward the people that beat me or jailed me. Representative Lewis, talk a little bit about your life as a boy in Troy and the support you received from your family, and how did they feel about you being in this new movement? Well, when I was growing up uh, outside of Troy, Alabama, on, on this farm, we worked very, very hard, picking cotton, gathering peanuts, pulling corn, and raising chickens and cows and hogs. I fell in love with raising chickens, like no one else could raise chickens. I became very good at it, really. I used to preach to these chickens. I used to talk to these chickens. I used to baptize these chickens. As a matter of fact, when uh, a chicken would get sick, we would heal the chicken, and when one would die, we would have a chicken funeral, and I would deliver the eulogy. So the chickens uh, taught me a sense of patience and discipline. They needed food. They needed water. But also, I had wonderful parents, wonderful mother, wonderful father. I, we grew up very poor, six brothers and, uh, and three sisters. But at the same time, I would fuss and... Like, I, I was nosy as a young child. Uh, they accused me of being nosy, but I think I was inquisitive. I wanted to know why. Why segregation? Why racial discrimination? Why we cannot go here? Why we cannot go there? And they would tell me. I never got the right answer. And Dr. King provided the answer for me, that we had to do something about it. As a young teenager, our age, 16, 17, 18 years old, were you conscious of the civil rights movement, or were you busy dealing with everyday teenage struggles as we do today? I was uh, const well, very conscious of the civil rights movement because as a young child, uh, I attended segregated school. We would bus past a white middle school, a white high school. In high school, I attended something called Pike County Training School. The high school for blacks in that part of Alabama was called Training School. We had the, the hand-me-down and used book the dilapidated buses, and the overcrowded schools. And I, I knew something was wrong. So I was very conscious that something had to give. And when I was 16 with brothers and sisters and first cousins, we went down to the library, just trying to get library cards, trying to check out some books. And we were told because we were black, we couldn't use the library. But we paid taxes to help support the library, and I felt that was wrong. So I was very conscious of that I wanted to do something. I wanted to be involved. And Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks provided the way for me to get involved. How did you conjure up enough strength not to retaliate eventually? Or just push you to that breaking point where you just had to just strike out one time or whatnot? Well, as I continue to say, I believe in nonviolence. Um, I think it's nonviolence and non-existence. That's what uh, Gandhi said, and Dr. King said on one occasion, um, we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters or we'll perish as fools. If we had engaged in violence, uh, the opposition would use that to justify a beating, maybe shooting and killing many of us. We didn't own uh, uh, the military. We didn't have police officers and state troopers. 
we had our bodies, we had an idea, and we put our bodies on the line, and we subscribed to the idea of peace, love, and nonviolence. You talked about how love got you through that nonviolence. Um, a lot of us live in the north side of Minneapolis, and we really don't see um, nonviolence being portrayed, and we see violence every day, whether it be on the street or at school. And you talked about how love got you through that. How can um, we as teenagers um, show the younger ones that love, even though they might not get it at home or at school, they look out on the streets for that love? Well, as teenagers and as young people, you can start your own group studying the principles of nonviolent, conduct a nonviolent workshop. When I was in school at Fisk University in Nashville, an American Baptist a theological seminary and other schools like Vanderbilt and Peabody and Tennessee State and Mahara Medical School and the high schools students. We all came together and every Tuesday night for the entire school year at 6.30 p.m. we would go to a little church, black and white students, and we would study the philosophy of nonviolence. We studied what Gandhi attempted to do in South Africa, what he accomplished in India. We studied the role in civil disobedience. We studied the great religions of the world, even before we had the first sit-in, before we even had a dream about going on the Freedom Ride. And Nashville and other cities where you had a strong nonviolent movement, you had less violence. When people were sitting in in Nashville or marching in Birmingham or marching in Selma, there were less violence in the larger black community. Now you said you followed a nonviolent, loving belief. Was there anybody that you know, loved you a close person to you that tried to hold you back from what you were doing? That oh, there were, there were people, there were individuals saying that we were crazy, that we were foolish. And there were some people saying, you know, why go and get arrested? Why go and be beaten? Uh, I was beaten once during the, during the city, and people said, you're crazy. Why go over and over again? We can file one case and take it all the way to the United States Supreme Court. You don't need to get arrested again. You don't need to go to jail again. But then we went on the freedom ride, blacks and white students. And we were beaten. The bus that we were on was almost burned. Uh, we were met by an angry mob. But we kept going, and people tried to discourage us. But we wanted to see dramatic change, and we didn't want to wait forever. On one occasion, someone suggested that we should have a cooling off period, that we should stop sitting there, we should stop going on the freedom ride. And one of the black leaders said, if we cool off anymore, we'll be in a deep defreeze. So we had to keep marching. We had to keep sitting there. Now, uh, a question um, that is similar to Lewis is, you just talked about how there were people who necessarily didn't feel that you should be doing anything. Did you know people, or were you close to people who felt that the nonviolent approach was completely wrong and that you should take a violent, more um, sort of aggressive and ferocious approach to that? There were some individuals, local individuals, as well as some uh, national leaders who suggested uh, that we should lay down the way of nonviolence and engage in self-defense. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. King would say, if we use the way of violence, use the weapons of, of violence, uh, we all will be blind and lame. And that's not the way. Violence may bring about some temporary changes but if you want meaningful and lasting changes, you want to create a beloved community, or create what I like to call one house, one family, one community, then the way of nonviolence is the way. I happen to believe that the way of nonviolence is one of those immutable changes, principles, that you do not deviate from. Were you ever afraid or discouraged when you use the nonviolence tactics, especially during the Freedom Ride, where you were beaten unconscious and you said that you saw death, like you saw the face of death, like after that period, were you ever discouraged or were you ever afraid to use the nonviolent tactic? Even in the face of death and, and seeing some of my friends and colleagues injured, beaten, bloody, unconscious, and some literally dying, um, I was never ever afraid to continue the way of nonviolence. When we went on the Freedom Ride in 1961, uh, many of us thought we wouldn't return. Uh, we wrote letters like Will saying, if this happened to me, if I don't return, 
do this, do that. Um, but you always had that sense of hope that somehow, in some way, right, love, goodness would prevail. So we're learning that the son of a sharecropper is becoming a young leader in this new growing civil rights movement. This was all captured by the media of the times. Let's take a look at that. Look closely at film and photos from the civil rights movement and you see John Lewis's commitment and leadership in action. Here he is in historic newsreel footage from the Nashville sit-ins where well-organized students trained in nonviolence resisted brutal attacks and chipped away at discrimination in business practices. The Freedom Rides used nonviolent direct action to confront segregated transportation. John Lewis was among the first Freedom Riders. Pictures from the event show how he was seriously injured by racist mobs. Selma was the battleground for voting rights. There is young John Lewis on the front lines of the nonviolent march of Bloody Sunday. Pictures are worth a thousand words, and images from the civil rights movement speak to the leadership of John Lewis. Some very powerful images and painful images. Representative Lewis, can you talk about the Nashville sit-ins, and do you believe that they were the catalyst for the movement? The Nashville sit-ins, perhaps more than any other place in the South, was so well organized, so disciplined, because we had a wonderful teacher, young Methodist minister by the name of Jim Lawson. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used to say that James Lawson had a better understanding of the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence than anyone he knew. We have what we call role playing, social drama, where, and I know today young people have a lot of drama, but uh, we had social drama, until a real drama, where a group of black and white students would come together, high school students, college students. Blacks would play the role of whites, whites would play the role of blacks, and sometimes it would be an interracial group. Nashville was a segregated city. You can go downtown and, and buy something. If you want to buy a suit, a dress, you can try it on. There would be a restaurant, a lunch counter. You can take a seat. You have to get something, take it out on the street to eat. So we would talk to sit in, and we would go down in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion. Just sit all day, waiting to be served, reading a book, working on a paper, or looking straight ahead. And someone would come in and beat us, pull us off the lunch counter stool, pour hot water on us, hot, hot coffee, hot chocolate, a spit on us, and we'd just look straight ahead. While all that happened with the hot coffee and the cigarettes being put on in your hair, when you were looking straight forward, what was going through your mind? Like, what was, I know they say keep your eye on the prize, but what was that, what were you thinking about at that time? But in a real sense, I was thinking what we have discovered in learning about nonviolence, that we were being tested and that we had to pass the test. And the great majority of us passed the test. We would be arrested in jail and taken off to jail. But because we didn't strike back, we appealed to the conscience of hundreds and thousands of citizens all across Nashville, black and white, who in turn supported us. And people around America saw these well-dressed high school students and college students sitting there, not fighting, not talking back, not laughing out, just bearing witness to what we believed in. It changed Nashville, and it led to the desegregation of all of the the stores and lunch counters and restaurants. I just wanted to ask, could you believe actually what was happening that you were so outnumbered and, and just in sheer people that you felt, I mean, just hopeless that there was nothing to be done further? I, I, know, it's, I know you've already touched on it, but just again, there were just so many people there. Just, how did you feel? Well, sometimes I see the, the image and film footage of us being beaten, later arrested, and put in a police wagon and taken to jail. And I see the mob cheering. Uh, it's hard for me to believe. It's difficult for me to believe sometimes that it really did happen. But it did happen. 
that fellow American, your fellow citizens, would treat you this way simply because you want to desegregate a lunch counter, a restaurant, or a theater. But it happened in America, and doing so, it changed things. Uh, so we come such a great distance because people were willing, brave, and courageous young people. Some were so young to put their bodies on the line. We're not as segregated. We still have like little segregations. Like if you were at school, there might be blacks so who sit with blacks and whites sit with whites. But are you happy with the outcome of how we are today and like the desegregation that we do have? Or do you think we should still keep fighting? Well, I'm very happy and very pleased that we've come such a distance that we come so far, but we still have a great distance to go. There's still too many people left out and left behind. And it's not just African-American or black people in the American South, but all across America. Uh, Hispanic, Asian-American, women, Native American, people have been put down because of their race, their color, and their gender, and it's not right, it's not fair. So anytime we see segregation or see discrimination or see someone being put down, we have to find a way to speak up and speak out and not be quiet. Do you see yourself as a role model to the Native Americans? Like to, to my, my, the people that I look up to, do you think that, that you inspired them on anything? Well, I think, that I, I, Justin, I really believe that the Civil Rights Movement have inspired and not just African American, but all American. I spent time with Native American. I, I've gone to Winter Rock in, in Arizona and spent time with the Navajo and other members of the Native American community. And any time any segment of the society is being discriminated against, we all are being discriminated against. The last time I saw Martin Luther King Jr. alive was in March of 1968 at a little restaurant in Atlanta. He was trying to create something called a Poor People's Campaign. He was bringing together in that room was black, white, Native American, Hispanic, Asian American. It was Little America all together. How did you convince like Caucasian people to join in on the sit-ins? Because I, I, I would feel that there would probably be a sense of fear. How did you like convince them to sit in with you guys? Well, there was many white Southerners, and White people, not necessarily from the South, but many in the South saw segregation. They felt it was wrong. Many white students participated. And for many, many, on many occasions, uh, some of the greatest violence were heaped on those white participants because people saw them as betraying the race. And they were called in lovers. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, some of my white colleagues, and friends that grew up in Alabama, in Georgia, and from other parts of America were severely beaten because of their participation. Um, there was a white minister who was beaten and later died. There were others uh, in Alabama, in Georgia, in Mississippi who had to leave the state and go someplace else to live. Do you think that the white participants helped you guys do what you had to do? Do you think people that believed in segregation started to join and started to get different views of how things were starting to ha were going to happen? Uh, the whites that participated did make a contribution, a great contribution. And there have been white people in the South that believed in segregation, and, and later they changed. Uh, I was back in Birmingham not too many years ago after taking a trip with some of my colleagues from the Congress. We went to Birmingham, to Selma, and to Montgomery. And a middle-aged white man came up and he said to me, Congressman Lewis, I want to apologize to you on behalf of all of the white people of Alabama, what we did. And you hear white people all across the South saying, you not just freed the black community, you freed all of us. Representative Lewis, talk a little bit about the Freedom Rides, how they came about. We know that there was many white people who were on those Freedom Rides as well. How did that come about? The Freedom Rides started in May of 1961 to test a decision of the United States Supreme Court banning segregation and racial discrimination in public transportation. Uh, we met in Washington, D.C. on May 1st, 
1961 to go through a period of orientation. There was 13 of us on the original ride, seven whites and six blacks. In 1961, it would be impossible for an interracial group to board a Greyhound bus or a trailway bus and travel from Washington, D.C. through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, into Alabama or Mississippi, into New Orleans, and that's where I, itinerary. You go into a so-called white waiting room, and in this so-called white waiting room, there's a barber shop, and one young black man tried to get a shoe shine in the so-called white barber shop. He was arrested and taken to jail. The next day, the charges were dropped, and he was released from jail. My seatmate, a white gentleman, the two of us tried to enter a so-called white waiting room in a little town in South Carolina, Rock Hill, South Carolina. An angry mom met us at the door of the waiting room, beat us, and left us lying in a pool of blood. And the freedom rides continued through Georgia into Alabama. The bus were tight and burned between Atlanta and uh, Birmingham. And then the angry mob that grew to more than 3,000 people met us in Montgomery and beat us and left us bloody and unconscious. The freedom rides continued into Mississippi where we all were jailed. More than 300 people were jailed. And the great majority of those young people that came from all across America were young whites to participate in the Freedom Ride. We filled the city jail in Jackson, Mississippi, the county jail, and later they transferred us to the state penitentiary at Parchment. But most of us stayed up to 40 days and we got out. But it led to the desegregation of public transportation all across the South. We changed the South forever during the Freedom Ride. It was easy. It was easy in a way. It was simple in a way. You buy a ticket. You board a bus. Blacks go to the front of the bus. Whites go to the back of the bus. You go to a so-called white waiting room as an interracial group. You sit and wait. Or you go to a so-called colored waiting room, an interracial group. And you get arrested. You go to jail. But it was dangerous. It was very dangerous to go on the Freedom Ride. When you look back on all you've accomplished, I mean, what is... How does that feel? Like I can only imagine how much pride you must feel to have gone through all that, and here you are today, successful. Just what does it feel like today, looking back on what you've been through? Well, when I go back to places like Selma, uh, to Birmingham, or Nashville, or back to the area where I grew up, and see the changes, uh, I, I'm very proud. Uh, but I'm proud to see people taking advantages, really taking advantage of the doors of opportunity, the doors that we open. And the little town near where I grew up is different. It is so much better. People were so afraid. There was so much fear. The fear is gone. Those signs are gone. And people are living and getting along like people should get along. Talk a little bit more about Selma the march there, what it meant to the movement and to you as well? Selma, this little sleepy town in the heart of the Black Belt of Alabama near the Alabama River. It's about 50 miles south of Montgomery. It was a mean place. You had a sheriff there by the name of Jim Clark. He was a very big man, mean, tall, mean. A lot of white people were afraid of him. The black people were afraid of him. He wore a gun on one side, a nightstick on the other side, and he carried an electric cap rider in his hand, and he didn't use it on cows. He wore a button on his left lapel that said, never. And people would go teachers, high school principals, like lawyers and doctors, would go day in, day out, trying to get a copy of the so-called literacy test, to pass the test to become a registered voter and he would block that entrance to the courthouse. We went down one day, and he just started beating people. There was a young minister who worked with Dr. King, just beat him, beat him. And this minister pleaded to him, said, if you're going to beat us, beat us so the world can see. And he just continued to beat this young minister. He called me an outside agitator, a troublemaker, then had me arrested and taken to jail. But after a series of nonviolent protests in Selma, and a young man being beaten, shot, and killed, 
We attempted to march from Selma to Montgomery on March 7, 1965. At that time, I was 25 years old, head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, one of the major civil rights groups. We made it to the highest point on the bridge, at the Pettus Bridge crossing the Alabama River. Down below, we saw a sea of blue, Alabama State Troopers. We saw members of Sheriff Clark Posse. He had requested that all white men over the age of 21 to come down to the courthouse the night before to be deputized to become part of his posse to stop the march. So when we got near the foot of the bridge, a major of the Alabama State Troopers said, this is an unlawful march, we'll not be allowed to continue. I give you three minutes to disperse and return to your church. In less than a minute and a half, he said, troopers advance. You saw these men putting on their gas masks. They came toward us, beating us with knife sticks and bull whips, tramping us with horses, releasing their tear gas. Was hit in the head by a state trooper with a knife stick. Had a concussion at the bridge. I thought I was going to die. I thought I saw death. Forty years later, I don't recall how I made it across that bridge, back to that little church that we had left from. But I recall being at the church that Sunday afternoon, and someone asked me to say something to the audience. And I stood up and said something like, I don't understand it. How President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam, but can I send troops to Selma, Alabama, to protect people who only desires to register to vote? The next thing I knew had been admitted to this little hospital in Selma. The next day, Dr. King came by to visit me and said, don't worry, John, we'll make it from Selma to Montgomery. And we did. And when we left Selma, it was not just the 600 of us but there was more than 10,000 black and white citizens. And when we arrived in Montgomery, there were more than 25,000 people. I remember one day when we were walking from Selma to Montgomery. It was a five-day walk. It rained, it thundered, it lightened. Dr. King was wearing a cap on his head. He took the cap off and placed it on my head. And he said, John, you need to wear this cap. You've been hurt. You need to protect your head. I would never forget that uh, kind of act on, on his part. Um, but that effort's changed Selma. And today in Selma, you have a black mayor, you have an interracial city council, black judges, black fire chief, black uh, uh, chief of police. So it's a different world. In 1965, when we walked across that bridge, only 2.1% of blacks of voting age were registered to vote. 1963, you must keep in mind in 1963, the summer of 1963, Mega Evers, an NACP leader, had been assassinated in Mississippi. Bull Connor had used the dogs and fire hoses on young children, young women in Birmingham. Been hundreds and thousands of people had been arrested in jail. And we had a meeting with President Kennedy in June of 63, and in that meeting we told him that we were going to march on Washington. And a few days later, we went all across America recruiting people. And hundreds and thousands of people came from the state of Minnesota, from all over America, all over to march. And I remember so well that day, even before that day, I was working on my speech for the March on Washington. I was one of the speakers. And I was reading a copy of the New York Times, and I saw a group of like women in Southern Africa carrying signs saying, one man, one vote. So in my March on Washington speech, I said something like, one man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours, too. It must be ours. And when they introduced me to speak, I stood up, more than 250,000 people. I looked to my left. I looked to my right. I looked straight ahead. And I said to myself, this is it. And I started speaking. And it went well. And when Dr. King got up to speak, I tell you, I've heard Dr. King speak so many times. But on this day, he spoke from his gut. He spoke from his soul. And when he started saying, I have a dream today, a dream that is deeply rooted in American dream. You feel like you just want to say hallelujah. Uh, we knew then that we were going to make it. It's going to be all right. My question pertains especially to the summer march. Um, how did you prepare yourself to know that you were leading all of these people over that bridge and that possibly 
they could be killed and injured. How did you prepare yourself knowing that you were in the front of that, that you would have to look Sheriff Clark in the eyes and say, we're doing it? Well, on, on that day of the, of the march from Selma to Montgomery, we conducted a nonviolent workshop. We had a prayer. We said a, had a song. And it was to be quiet and silent. And we just, only thing you can hear is sort of pick them up, lay them down. It was like military discipline. I, I thought we would be arrested. I didn't have any idea that we would be beaten. But when I saw the state troopers and members of Sheriff Clark Posse with that gas mask on, and I saw men on horseback, I knew something was going to happen. And we sort of made arrangement for the men to be in the front and in the back, and the children, the women, would be in the center. My greatest fear, my greatest concern was when I was there on the ground and before I lost consciousness of what was happening to the other people. I felt a sense of responsibility. But in the movement, we knew it was a possibility that any of us uh, could be beaten uh, or killed. So we were prepared to die if necessary. In John Lewis's autobiography, Walking with the Wind, he wrote about a dramatic moment in his childhood as a metaphor for making America a better place. Take a look. I had an aunt by the name of Seneva, and Aunt Seneva lived in a shotgun house. Sometimes when it would rain, she would take a bucket, a pail, a tub to catch the rainwater. At night, sometimes you can look up through the ceiling of the house, through the tin roof, and count the stars. Well, on this particular Saturday afternoon, we were out playing in her dirt yard, and an unbelievable storm came up. The wind started blowing, the thunder started rolling, the lightning started flashing, and she suggested that we all should get inside of her old shotgun house. She suggested that we all should hold hands. The wind continued to blow, the thunder continued to roll, the lightning continued to flash, and the rain continued to beat on this old house. Mark became terrified. She started crying, and all of us young children, we started crying. We thought this old house was going to blow away. And when one corner of this old house appeared to be lifted from its foundation, we were up to that corner, trying to hold this house down with our little bodies. When the other corner appeared to be lifted, we would walk to that corner, trying to hold this house down with our little bodies. We were little children walking with the wind. We never left the house. We must never leave the house today. We must try to hold the American house together and create one house, one family, the American house, the American family. Through all your hard work and struggles and perseverance, how do, or in our schools today, how can we let other groups know about your struggles and what we've we done? And also, how can we, I want to say, rejuvenate all this like, information and how can we educate the people today about uh, all the struggles you've gone through? Because I know today in our, my school personally, I know we can continually continue to uh, teach them and tell them about everything, but it, it just didn't seem to click with them all the time. So how can we bring it, like, bring it to another direction to show them what, like, how important this really is to us? I think it's important, uh, say, in your school or in any school, for teachers, educators, uh, to teach the, the civil rights movement. And it shouldn't be taught just during uh, African American History Month. But there's a series of uh, film called uh, Eyes on the Prize. And people should be encouraged to watch that and see how another generation of young people felt about segregation and racial discrimination, how we were able to tear down those walls, tear down those signs. And it should be part of lesson plan. And maybe in the school you can organize different groups uh, 
chapters. See, we don't have organization like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee anymore, and, but we cannot wait for someone to come along. You have to do it. Just organize yourself. And so we're going to make our school better. We're going to make our town better, our village, our city, our country. So as you said before, just get in the way. Just get in the way and do, start what you got to do to make, to make it known, your own group or something, to make it known what, you, what we're trying to get across. But if you feel something and you believe in something, believe in something that is so right, so fair, and so just, and you want to be part of bringing about change, you cannot wait for someone else to do it. You have to do it. And that's why I say you just get in the way. See, I think today, I think young people, and not just young people, but I think all of us are too quiet. We need to make a little noise sometimes so we can be heard. We, I used to say when I was very young, they would say, John, what do you think about it? What should we do? And I would say, we need to find a way to dramatize the issue. Now, I know um, you believe in different things, but if you feel something, just do something. Dr. King would say, don't be quiet, push and pull. You, you don't have to uh, go out and turn things upside down, but you can do it in a peaceful, nonviolent fashion, helping to educate people about certain problems or certain issues. It may not even be around the issue of race, but it could be around uh, culture or some other issue that you can bring together a group to deal with it. Today, so, Bazell, why don't you talk a little bit about why Zeta and what maybe you could bring back or what you would want to ask Representative Lewis of how you could bring something back from this day? Okay, um, well, I go to YZ High School, which is a predominantly Caucasian school. And my question to you is, how can we do more to integrate our schools? Because we seem to segregate ourselves, not based on law, but on our comfort, comfort zone. And like at YZ, we don't even observe, or they don't observe, or they don't celebrate Black History Month. And like, what can we do to do that and bring about change and teach about the civil rights farther than what, beyond than what the textbooks teach us? Well, I think you should uh, be a committee of one. Uh, maybe invite some others to join you and go into your principal or to your teacher, or speaking to a member of the school board. And so we can do better. We can do much better. So something is missing here. And sometimes it would take the, the leadership and the involvement of individual students uh, to convince a teacher, a principal, a school superintendent, a member of the school board uh, to move in the direction. Uh, we're not completely educated unless we know a little something about everybody and everything. We, we, you know, we live in an unbelievable country, unbelievable society. It's not all black, it's not all white, but there are other groups. There's Native American, Hispanic, Asian American, and as I've said over and over again, in order to make our country and make our world a better place, we have to learn to live together as brothers and sisters so we will perish as food. And no better place to start than in our school when we were very young. Now, Congressman Lewis, just to touch on something you said previously, uh, you were talking about how we need to dramatize um, anything that we want to achieve right now. And I believe that one of the biggest problems we have um, in today's culture is that the civil rights movement then and now is romanticized. And it, I mean, it should be, it was an amazing thing. It took a lot of courage and bravery. And the injustices that were portrayed during that time were so large and so unhidden that it was sort of hard for it not to be a momentous movement. But it seems nowadays that since we don't have outright segregation anymore, we have equal schooling, that people seem to let it fall by the wayside. So one question I'd like to ask you is how can, how do you see um, young people today, and not, young, not just young people, but um, politicians, since you are, of course, a congressman, how can you describe a way to us to better represent the injustices that are still going on today. When we see something that, that is wrong today, we have to speak out. We have to act. We cannot be silent. Uh, Sometimes the simple thing of picking up a pen 
and a piece of paper and writing a letter to the editor of your local newspaper or maybe to the school paper or writing an article saying to your colleagues, to your friends, your fellow schoolmates and classmates, this is wrong, let's do something about it. You, you don't, we cannot wait for another Martin Luther King Jr. We have to do it ourselves. Um, that's only one problem. And as, as I tried to suggest earlier, it's not just a problem of race. I'm concerned about the environment. People say, why should we be concerned about the environment? I said from time to time, we have a right to know what in the food we eat. We have a right to know what is in the water we drink. We have a right to know what is in the air we breathe. And this planet, this little piece of real estate that we call Earth, we must all learn to live together and not be greedy and destroy it or waste it, but leave it a little cleaner and a little greener for unborn generation. We should be concerned about health care, that there are people work every single day, the working poor, but they don't have the resources to get health care. And we should see that all of our children, all of our young people, get the best possible education. And then create a world community at peace with itself. Representative Lewis, will you talk a little bit about the, um, maybe the difference between poor blacks and middle class blacks? And do you think at this point, um, there's been lots of conversations on Bill Cosby's comments about the black family. Is there a huge difference there? And how can we have those two groups come together a little bit more? Well, you know, at, at one time, at one time, especially in the South, it didn't matter whether you were a Ph.D. or no D. It didn't matter if some people said whether you got it from Moore House or your house. <laughs> really. It, uh, because, because segregation, you could be a millionaire. You can be a blank millionaire. We have a guy in Atlanta who's a wonderful friend, a big supporter of mine, very wealthy. His name is Herman Russell. He's a big developer, big builder, very successful. But in 1960, 61, 62, he can go to a lunch counter. He could buy that lunch counter. He could buy that store. You had a guy like A.G. Gaston, who was a big, very successful multimillionaire in Birmingham, Alabama. But he couldn't go downtown and drink out of so-called white water, water fountain. So after desegregation, you, you saw this unbelievable and moving gap between poor and, and middle class and those at, at, the, at the top. So a lot of people in, in our country that are poor have been left out and left behind. And it's not just true in the American South and not just true in rural America, but I think what happened in New Orleans with Katrina mm -hmm. probably dramatized more than anything in recent years the problem of race and poverty. These are the people, they couldn't get out. They didn't have an automobile. They didn't have the money to buy a bus ticket or get on a plane and fly from New Orleans to Houston or Dallas or to Atlanta. So they were stuck. And I think there's a need, Leah, there's a great need for members of the black middle class uh, to reach back and, and try to help and bring people along. Uh, it is a it's, it's an ongoing problem uh, in the in the American society. Um, we got to solve the problem, as Du Bois said. The problem of the 20th century is a problem of race, a color, the color line, and maybe the problem of the 21st century in America is still race, but it's more than race. It's poverty. It's health care. Um, and we got to work on it. Representative Lewis, you had mentioned SNCC before. Will you talk a little bit about SNCC and how it started and if that could be a basis for what these young people could start? Well, I think today's young people can learn a great deal from the young people of another period. SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the nickname of people call it SNCC, S-N-I-C-K, but it was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It was a group of young people. It was Martin Luther King Jr. under the leadership of a young woman by the name of Ella Baker. Black woman, grew up in North Carolina, worked for the NACP, later for Dr. King. 
When the sit-in started, he asked her to hold a conference to bring together these students that were sitting in all across the South. And she had a meeting in North Carolina, Easter weekend, 1960, April 1960, where we met. And that's where the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was founded. It was called a Temporary Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in April 1960. Then it met again in October 1960 on Morehouse campus in Atlanta and it became a permanent organization. And it was the young people, black and white, that went all across the South, not just participating in the sit-ins and the Freedom Rides, but it went into the heart of Mississippi, in the Southwest Georgia, the Black Belt of Alabama, the most dangerous part of the South. These young people, these college students, these Snickers, a lot of the local people call them the Freedom Riders, and it was sort of, sort of like Paul Revere's coming. You would hear people saying, the Freedom Riders, they refer to many people that were not Freedom Riders, but they refer to us all as being the Freedom Riders, that we were coming. It was like these folks coming to change us, to liberate us. Well, I go to a predominantly African-American school, and <clears throat> the civil rights means a lot to me. It seems how if it weren't for the civil rights, I probably wouldn't have half the friends I have today. And I, w I would like to know what's your opinion on how the civil rights has affected other ethnicities and how we could all come together and form some kind of group where we can all have different ethnicities come together and talk to one another and that kind of thing. How do you suggest we would go about doing that as a student body? Well, I think uh, the, the civil rights movement changed all of us and freed and liberated all America. That's why I said from time to time, Martin Luther King Jr. must be looked upon as one of the founding fathers of the new America. He liberated not just black people and freed not just black people, but he freed all of us and we are better people. I hear people all the time saying, white southerners saying, thank you, John. Thank you, John Lewis, for what you did. You made me a better human being. Um, in that process, we have to move every single day, every single step of bringing people together and creating, again, one family. I know you get tired of me saying this, but it's one family. It's, it's, it's one house. We all live in the same house. And all of us must have a place at the table, at the same table, just like a big family. And it doesn't matter whether we're black a white, a Hispanic, an Asian American, a Native American. We're one family, we're one people, we're one house. And Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement opened up all the possibilities for us just to be human beings. Corey's off of that, will you tell the story about when you were younger and your grandmother had the shotgun house and you had the big storm and you were saying how when one side of the house slipped up you went over your little bodies and you tried your best to put it down like how do you how do you pertain that metaphor to America today? Well today as a member of Congress um, and as an individual I think I'm doing my little part in trying to hold this house together. I think the young people that marched in Birmingham, the people that marched from Selma to Montgomery all of the hundreds and thousands of black and white, Hispanic and Asian and Native American that participated in all of the great movement and struggle played a role in holding the house together. So another generation played a role. They did their part. And we must continue to do our part in holding this house together. In spite of all of the problems, in spite of all of the difficulties, I say we must never, ever give up. We must never, ever give in must never become bitter or hostile. We must keep the faith, keep our eyes on the prize, and believe that we can hold this house together. Not just the American house, but the world house. What challenge would you have for young people today in our generation to accomplish in the future? Well, my uh, message to young people today is to, to learn as much as you can. Read. I had a teacher when I was in, I guess, the sixth or seventh grade, said, my child, read. Read. And I tried to read everything. Read. Get involved. Keep up with current events. Study history. And do your part. 
you, you must keep in mind that during the 60s, we didn't have an email address. We never heard of a website. We didn't have a fax machine. We didn't have a cellular telephone. But we used what we had. And today with the new technology, you have so much more. So much more. And you have to use it for good. What a great conversation we have had here today. I think something that we've all learned from all ages. And thank you so much for watching Civil Rights Across Generations. A special thank you to you, Representative John Lewis, for sharing your information, being so courageous. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Rights Across Generations is a co-production of the General Mills Foundation, Champions for a Stronger Community, on the web at generalmills.com backslash foundation, and TPT's Minnesota channel.